Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm Nick, and I'm just here to do a freebie video this week. Um, it's not part of the On Buddhism series or the On the Dharma series. Um, it's just going to be a reading of a book that I got and I thought would be interesting. Um, I might do some readings from this book, um, readings and a little bit of discussion and explanation throughout the course of you know this class that I'm doing, um, just when I feel like it. I got this book um, last night and I got a little bit of the way through it and I thought it would be pretty interesting to talk about. Um, it's called The Voice of Silence by H.P. Blavatsky. H.P. Blavatsky was a Russian immigrant um, in the late 1800s and she's the founder of what we call the Theosophical Movement. This is a religious and philosophical movement in the West um, that sought to blend ideas from Eastern religions and Eastern experiences, but also with Western ideas um, in religion and philosophy, but also including um, occultism and uh, spiritual aspects of that. Um, there's a lot of controversy around this book, The Voice of Silence. H.P. Uh, Blavatsky claims that she went to the East, went to India or Nepal or somewhere, and met with two masters. She called them Mahatmas. And um, according to her, they taught her this Sutra of the Golden Precepts. Um, and this is a Buddhist document, uh, according to her. And she apparently learned this by heart um, in a group of students. And then she came back to the West and translated it by heart. Um, she translated it from memory by heart. Um, the, the document is popular. It's very popular in the theosophical movement and stuff, and it's got a lot of good ideas in it. There is some criticism and controversy about it because people claim that she actually never went to the East. There's no proof. There's no proof of the existence of the master she met with, no proof of the existence of the sutra that she's discussing, no proof of her trip or other students. Um, no one really knows if it happened. However, regardless of the authenticity or historicity of the tale, she um, definitely has some Buddhist ideas in this book. And um, like it or not, for scholars, this did end up helping spread Buddhist ideas and um, some Buddhist concepts and experiences in the Western, in the Western world and through the Western lens. And so to that end, some um, Buddhist scholars, such as Dr. D.T. Suzuki. Uh, you might be familiar with him. He's a large proponent of Zen Buddhism. He's done a lot of work to spread Buddhist ideas in the West. Um, he said that this is the real Mahayana. Um, and if you remember, Mahayana Buddhism is the school of Buddhism for lay people, for people who have bills and jobs and cars that break down and children that scream and um, garbage disposals that get clogged, and regular old suffering folk. And the one that, uh, and that's the Buddhism that I focus on mainly in these series and in this video and in my own practice. Um, he said this is the real Mahayana, and even the Dalai Lama has commented on this book saying that it is clearly influenced by some Buddhist ideas and has done, and it has done a lot for the spread of Buddhist ideas in the West, regardless of the factuality or the existence of the sutra or of her trip or of other students or of the masters or anything. So I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs from this and we'll discuss and explain and unpack and talk about how it's relevant to uh, what we're going through, what we're going over in the class right now. If thy soul smiles while bathing in the sunlight of thy life, if thy soul sings within her chrysalis of flesh and matter, if thy soul weeps inside her castle of illusion, if thy soul struggles to break the silver thread that binds her to the master, know, O disciple, thy soul is of the earth. When to the world's turmoil thy budding soul lends ear, when to the roaring voice of the great illusion thy soul responds, when frightened at the sight of the hot tears of pain, when deafened by the cries of distress, thy soul withdraws like the shy turtle within the carapace of selfhood. Learn, O disciple of her silent God, thy soul is an unworthy shrine. Okay, there's a lot 
going on in there. As you can tell, the language is kind of like the Bible. There's a lot of thys and thous and um, imagery and juxtaposition there. So let's go through some of these and unpack what's going on. In the first paragraph, if thy soul smiles while bathing in the sunlight of thy life, if thy soul sings within her chrysalis of flesh and matter. Basically, if you celebrate this life, if you exist in this life and in this body, this very body, and you um, feel it, and you feel like you are who you are, and you feel like you are a person, and you feel like you are made of flesh and matter, and like your soul occupies that flesh and matter, and if, it, if your soul is... Um, participating actively in this life, in, in the sunlight of thy life. If thy soul weeps inside the castle of illusion, if your soul is carried away by the illusions of the world, and it struggles to break the silver thread that binds her to the master, if you unknowingly create tension and separation in your life, your soul is of the earth. You're a person. Congratulations, these check all the boxes and you are a person. Basically, if you suffer, if you experience joy, if you cause your own suffering and cause other people's suffering, if you have suffering caused unto you, you are a person. If you think that this world is all there is, and if you think that um, your soul is part of what you are um, physically, meaning if you think that your soul and your body are the same, congratulations, you're a person. Everyone feels this way. But notice that she, she makes it clear that this is an illusory uh, scenario. This is a delusion. Um, remember that uh, the realm of samsara, of suffering and rebirth, um, it's an illusory sort of world. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world and we're stuck in it, meaning that um, the sensations of our five or six senses, um, the sixth being intellect, uh, these are all illusions and they're meant to, they're meant to satiate themselves. Um, and they are subject to the rule of dependent origination. So they're not actually substantially real. This speaks to the concept of emptiness, um, the whole universe being empty of substantial nature that we talked about before. The root of suffering is that emptiness. So if you experience that and if you suffer because of that, Congratulations, you're a sentient human being. When to the world's turmoil thy budding soul lends ear, when to roaring voice of a great illusion the soul responds, when frightened at the sight of hot tears of pain, when defeated by the cries of distress thy soul withdraws, like the shy turtle within the carapace of selfhood, learn, O disciple of her silent God, thy soul is an unworthy shrine. So what this means is, if you are aware of and experience suffering in the world, not only your own suffering, but the suffering of others. If you cry whenever ASPCA commercials come on, if you feel guilty whenever commercials asking you to donate to feed African children come on, whenever you look on the news and you see that something like 20 something million people have claimed unemployment just in the last month and you worry for that, but then you retreat to your own selfhood and say, but I'm okay. That kind of means your soul is an unworthy shrine. Um, and basically what this is discouraging against is an I-it relationship with the world. Um, I-it and I-thou relationships are, um, they're actually their own thing in the field of philosophy. I-it means um, you see everything as separate from you, everything and everyone. So, I am distinct from this book and from this camera and from my floor and from my neighbor. I thou, which is what this is encouraging you to feel, is a relationship between people where there is connection and flow of energy. It can also be between people and objects, but um, it's encouraging it between people and sentient beings. Um, the uh, kind of I thou relationship would be like a family member relationship. Um, family members are two distinct individuals but they also share a blood connection, a DNA connection. They also share physical and financial connection. They also share um, usually proximal connection. We are usually closer um, 
physically to our family members than to other people. Um, this is not the case very much anymore because people in the modern age move and travel and the world's gotten a lot smaller. But um, all this to say that an I-thou relationship is where you don't see separateness or separation. You don't see tension or difference. You see connection and similarity and sameness between you and the people of the world. This means that you um, recognize that all people are suffering together. Everyone has their own thing they're suffering for. Some people suffer for poverty. Some people suffer for hunger. Some people suffer for lots of things. Abuse in relationships. They suffer for just relationships in general. They suffer for addiction. They suffer for depression and anxiety. They suffer for dissatisfaction with their jobs. They, they suffer for many, many reasons, innumerable reasons. But everyone is suffering together. And that is cause for um, compassion. And that is cause for meditation. And that is cause for the bodhisattva path. The bodhisattva path, if you remember, is something that is very, very highly um, encouraged and emphasized in Mahayana Buddhism. The bodhisattva is one who works to become enlightened and in the process works towards securing and ensuring enlightenment for all sentient beings along the way. Um, bodhisattvas are teachers, they're leaders, and they are like saints in Catholicism in the sense that they embody some special quality about Buddhism or about the Buddha himself, and in the process they save other people. They alleviate the suffering of sentient beings in some way. So this is encouraging the Bodhisattva path, and it's encouraging that it, what it's saying is that the first step, or some of the first steps, is switching from an I-it relationship to an I-thou relationship with all sentient beings. But it's easiest to start with people. It's hard to really meditate on your relationship with an animal or with a plant or something like that. Um, because it seems, because of our culture and because of you know what science will tell us, it just seems like a very one-sided relationship. It's hard to, it's hard to get around that. Um, but it's easy to start with people. We All human beings suffer because this is a realm of suffering. This is a castle of illusions, as she says. And um, because of that, because we all share in suffering, we are in it together. And that is enough cause by itself for the kind of loving kindness and compassion that Buddhism encourages. So think about um, this. Consider, consider buying it. I got it for 99 cents on Kindle. Consider buying it and reading it yourself. It's hard to read. <laughs> it's admittedly hard to read. And um, you might find some imagery in there that's very confusing and stuff. But I I will continue to do little readings from there just for freebie videos here and there. Because um, it includes some important, important aspects of Buddhism in it. So I hope that this was informative or at least interesting to you. And if you have any suggestions for other stuff that I might read... Um, and explain and talk about, uh, please let me know. And um, anything you want to discuss about it, leave a comment and we'll talk about it. Um, I wish you all the best health, happiness, and safety and joy during the coronavirus pandemic and beyond. And I'll see you on Monday for our next On the Dharma and On Buddhism videos. Thank you.